And there's a raid happening right here at the ABC right now, just 100 metres or so that way. On the 5th of June 2019, the Australian Federal Police raided the ABC headquarters. The day before, they raided the home of News Corp journalist Annika Smethurst. In a country that calls itself a thriving democracy, how are journalists and their sources being targeted? And why is the law not protecting them? Our journalists do a really difficult job. They do it in the public's interest, and journalism is not a crime. This is how 20 years of lawmaking, fixated on counter-terror measures, has instead captured journalists and whistleblowers in its web. We may not be living in a police state, but we are living in a state of secrecy. CNN is reporting tonight that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. On September 11, 2001, four coordinated terror attacks shook the United States and sent a ripple of fear across the world. Here in Australia, in the wake of those attacks, the government shifted gears. I saw this as an attack on our common values. In the two decades since, we went from having zero counter-terror laws to 92. 5,000 pages of laws. These laws contain unprecedented powers and were overwhelmingly enacted in haste. Some of them in just a few hours, playing on urgency and fear. Is it offensive as well to Labor to say that they'd be backing terrorist communication here? Well, well I'll tell you what's offensive. It's running a protection racket for terrorist networks. They include preventative detention orders, citizen stripping, compulsory questioning on children as young as 14. They up in democratic rights like freedom of movement, the freedom from arbitrary detention, the right to a fair trial, and the presumption of innocence. Instead of a criminal justice system focused on past behaviours, these laws instead seem to tip over into punishing people for what they might do or say in future. And if you think that sounds a little bit broad, sweeping and frightening, you'd be right. Today, Australia has the most extensive and complex set of counter-terror laws anywhere in the Western world. They're sold to us as a way of protecting us, but what if there's something else they're protecting? They are normally rivals, but on Monday, all major news organisations in Australia joined forces. Commissioner, uh, have you seen the front page of The Australian today? I haven't. So you just show have me. you seen the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald? I have now. In the months after the AFP raids, every daily newspaper in the country redacted their front page. Our media was united in a shared campaign. When governments keep the truth from you, what are they covering up? If government operates on the basis of a culture which is keep things secret because we don't want it being discussed, then I think we, as people, would lose out. Secrecy offences make it a crime to even mention that some powers have been used. Metadata and decryption powers mean that journalists can't even guarantee that their sources won't be identified. And the definition of national security in the espionage laws extends to anything about Australia's political, military or economic relations with other countries. The effect of this on our press is chilling. Here's how the ABC's editorial policy director put it. We've killed off stories because of these laws, and we're not talking about trivial stories, we're talking about important stories. The threat of prosecution hanging over journalists and whistleblowers reflects a growing culture of secrecy right across government. When ABC journalist Andrew Probin asked for information on waiting times for disability support, he was sent these almost completely redacted documents. In 2019 to 20, the Prime Minister's office only met a response deadline for 7.5% of freedom of information requests. And in the same year, across all departments, their refusal of FOI requests was up 71%. And all of this, it's not just felt nationally. Australia has dropped five places on the Global Press Freedom Index in just the last three years. In the United States, if you contact a public official, they have an obligation in their constitution to be as open as they possibly can. In this country, public officials have, uh, seems to have uh, the reverse obligation. This is a government that does not like scrutiny. And the laws they're enacting are making it increasingly difficult for those who seek to scrutinise. While the AFP raids made global headlines, there was another controversy brewing. Bernard Caleri, the lawyer for the intelligence whistleblower known as Witness K, sought legal proceedings against the Australian government for the fraud it committed against Timor Leste. The Howard government then had the Australian Secret Intelligence Service install listening devices in East Timor's ministerial offices to eavesdrop 
on East Timor's deliberations. And the operation Australia. was illegal, unscrupulous and remains unresolved. Kaleri and Witness K were charged as criminals for exposing what the Australian government had done. It was an extraordinary hearing conducted in a courtroom with cameras covered and glass doors blacked out. It becomes much more secretive than a terrorist trial or something of that nature. This could be, in a strange way, one of the most secretive trials in Australian history. This secrecy is enabled by a law designed to prosecute terrorism offences. These kinds of laws that impinge on individuals' rights are typical of wartime powers. During world wars, powers were enacted that did just that. But those laws were written with endpoints. Section 2 of the War Proportions Act 1914 stated, This Act shall continue in operation during the continuance of present state of war and no longer. Unlike war, we're told that the threat of terror has no end date. Laws to counter terror are being adapted to respond to threats like foreign interference, espionage, and right-wing extremism. And that means that these laws are in effect permanent. 92 laws repeatedly renewed or written without an end date, each one chipping away at our freedom to speak, report, and hold power to account. Today, our status as a leading democracy is fragile. As dire as this situation is, we can still repair the cracks. Here's how. We need to increase transparency. In a healthy democracy, governments are transparent and accountable, including and especially when they've done something wrong. We need to protect and value our free press. That means strengthening whistleblower protections and exemptions for journalists acting in the public interest. We need to strengthen oversight. That means reviewing the huge amount of power concentrated in the Home Affairs Department and opening up secret committees beyond just the major parties. And we need all of us to get involved. A healthy democracy thrives on political participation. So if you care about these issues, talk about them. Write to your local MP, make a submission to the next inquiry. Democracy means a government that acts in the interest of its people. And it's up to all of us to make those interests known. We'd love to answer any questions you have, so feel free to leave a comment if you have any. And if you're interested in press freedom and attacks on our democracy, we've just launched a report that is a massive deep dive on the issue. And thanks so much for watching. If you like what we do, don't forget to subscribe.